time. time. All the time. God, God is good. good. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you all. All who, though scattered in our homes on this second Sunday of the Easter season, are nonetheless gathered in spirit as the body of Christ. We are gathered as those who sometimes in the face of uncertainty or challenging circumstances still proclaim to the world those two simple truths, that God is good all the time and Christ is risen indeed. So wherever you happen to be today, hold on to this truth. May it give you peace in these anxious times. May it fill you with joy. To begin our worship today, I want to invite you to read with me responsively our call to worship. It is based on verses from Psalm 16. You, O God, are my portion, my cup. I will, I will bless, bless the Lord who advises, advises me. I will always put God in front of me. I will not stumble. That, that is, is why my heart celebrates and, and my, my mood is joyous. joyous. You won't abandon me. You teach me the way of life. In the your Lord presence, O oh God, there is beauty and joy. Won't you sing with us our opening hymn? It's an old favorite of mine. We sang it all the time when I was growing up. Up from the grave he arose. And we're going to sing it like I grew up singing it. A cappella. Oh, in the grave he my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, he arose with the mighty triumph o'er his foes, o'er his foes. He arose, a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, he arose, he arose hallelujah, Christ arose. Daily they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior, daily they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with the mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, he arose, he arose hallelujah, Christ my Savior, he tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, he arose with the mighty triumph o'er his foes, o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable 
and glorious joy. Would you pray with me now? Holy One, we long to see and to know you as the disciples saw and knew and loved Jesus as he walked among them. Help us, O oh God, to see you in our midst, to see your works in the beauty of nature as we celebrate them this week, this week of the 50th Earth Day. Guide us to care for your earth, Guide us to be good stewards of that with which you have entrusted us. Help us, O oh God, to see you, to see the face of Christ in those we meet, to see the beauty of the love of Christ in the eyes of those who we see around us. Help us, O oh God, to see Christ in our midst, in those who are in suffering and in need. O oh God, help us to feel your spirit moving amongst us, inspiring us, enlivening our spirits, guiding us to acts of love and service to those who are our neighbors. O oh God, we lift up to you this day all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. We pray your healing touch with those who suffer. We pray, O oh God, for those who are wrestling with challenges such as addiction. We pray for those who are affected by the COVID-19 virus. We pray for all of us who are wrestling with the challenges of dealing with this new reality in the face of a pandemic. Grant us patience, grant us strength, grant us encouragement and the knowledge that you are with us. God, we lift up to you those who are grieving losses. We pray for their comfort and that they may know the peace which comes from you, which passes all understanding. We also lift up to you, O oh God, those who are affected in this already challenging time by natural disasters, such as severe weather and storms and even tornadoes. God, be with those who are affected and help us all to be inspired to contribute to helping for the healing of all our world. Oh God, we pray these things and we pray together now as Jesus taught us to pray in the languages and phrasings that are meaningful to our hearts. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, beginning in verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. 
When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. What a remarkable story this gospel story is. So let's sing of that. Our next hymn is I Love to Tell the Story. after Easter, still physically isolating ourselves from one another in small groups. And as this passage in John's Gospel tells us, the disciples were doing something quite similar one week after Easter. On Easter evening, it tells us, the disciples had locked themselves inside out of fear. Fear of other people, to be more precise, huddled or at least hidden from the rest of the world. Mary and Peter had already seen the empty tomb, and Mary had already had a conversation with Jesus, and it's pretty safe to say word of that conversation had reached all the rest of the disciples by this point, but they were still hiding behind a locked door. They knew that the resurrection had happened, but they were afraid anyway. And then Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he showed them his wounded hands so they could know it was really him, and they rejoiced and they quite possibly had a party before he left them. And then Jesus did something on his way out that ritually sent them out, authorizing them and empowering them and inspiring them. And then a whole week later, a whole week after Easter, we find them still in that house. We're told at that point that Thomas was 
with them hadn't been earlier and was now. We'll get to him in a bit. For those who were there that first evening when Jesus came, they were gathered in small numbers, afraid, aware of the whole story of what had happened and all the details from every possible perspective and news source available to them. And then they got to experience the joy of Jesus being with them. But that experience of joy seems not to have changed much else about them, or how they were living, or what they were doing. It's not that they weren't full of joy, it's not that they didn't believe what their own eyes had seen, it's just that they hadn't done anything with it yet. The book of Acts tells us that the Holy Spirit fully came upon all the disciples after Jesus had ascended to heaven, just in time for Peter to stand up and preach a powerful sermon on Pentecost. Pentecost being another Jewish festival that happens 50 days after Passover, or seven weeks after Easter. But here they were one week after Easter, still staying home, playing it safe. Why? Perhaps because it wasn't time to go out yet. What Jesus gave his disciples was the gift of his presence and a continuing knowledge of his presence and the joy that comes from the continuing knowledge of his presence. But that didn't immediately push them into action. They had faith. They had joy. They had the promise of the Holy Spirit and all of the authority to act that would come with that. But his gift to them was not one that inspired them to act impulsively. They were apparently, at that same moment, also given the gift of patience. The wisdom to know not just how to act, but when and when not to. Because there are times when patience and prudence feel like they are getting in the way of God's work, but they are actually what we need to embrace in order to really be doing the best thing, the best work for God and with God which apparently, according to the Gospel, sometimes includes staying home, as the disciples seem to be doing for that first week. Now, they did eventually, in their staying home, include their missing friend Thomas with them. Thomas, you may or may not recall, was a disciple of Jesus who was extremely loyal to him. In fact, John's Gospel tells us that when Lazarus died, and Jesus announced his intention to go to Jerusalem, the other disciples were protesting, reminding Jesus that there were people in Jerusalem that wanted to kill him. Thomas is the one who responded to all of them with the statement, Well then, let us go with him, so that we can die with him. Thomas would later go on to be the missionary who founded the first Christian churches in India, an act of deep, amazing faith, and yet, a lot of people remember him as doubting Thomas. Because having missed the party on the evening of Easter, he refused to be content with just hearing everybody else's stories about how alive Jesus was. He wanted to see for himself. In fact, he declared to the rest of them that he would not believe until he put his fingers in the nail marks on Jesus' body. The nickname Doubting Thomas evolved because our attention is so easily drawn to how different his reaction to the news of the resurrection was from the others. Or was it? The writer of this gospel makes a big point of repeating Jesus telling Thomas later on, blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe, and then pointing out that Jesus also did lots of other things that weren't written down, but the disciples saw them happen. And what was written down should hopefully be enough to inspire faith in anyone. All of this in a gospel penned by someone other than Thomas. Thomas, in case you weren't aware, does in fact have a gospel to his name, but it was left out of the Bible because it presented Jesus almost completely as just a wise human teacher and not the Son of God or the Messiah. It doesn't have that mystical quality that the rest of the Gospels have, daring to show us the whole picture of Jesus, whether it all makes sense to us or not. Some scholars even think that John's Gospel was written as a rebuttal of the Gospel of Thomas. Now, all of this implies that there was some kind of tension between Thomas and the rest of the disciples. They believed he questioned. They had faith from day one. He wanted more proof. But, but that's not really what this story shows us. In this telling, 
they had the chance to see the risen Christ for themselves, and Thomas did not. They got to see Jesus, and all he got was a pretty wild-sounding story he had to swallow. Yes, they all said it. It came from all of them at once. They all agreed on it, but he still missed out on the experience for himself. And in their passion for sharing what they now knew, they fixated on the fact that he was doubting, capturing it, and repeating it down through history, overlooking the simple fact that they had experienced something, and he had not. And if we paraphrase his words while remembering him as a loyal and faithful disciple, what he was really saying is nothing more than, hey, you got to see Jesus. I want that too. Modern slang has an acronym for this. FOMO. Fear of missing out. A stark realization that there are moments in life that can only truly be experienced firsthand. And getting a secondhand telling of that is just not the same. Seeing them on video, as is now possible with technology, is still not the same. Hearing all of your friends tell you about what you missed in great detail is just not the same as having that experience for yourself. The whole point of the Gospels is actually to open people up to the presence of Christ at work in our own lives, so that everyone might come to believe, not through some ancient tales of wonder, but by having our eyes opened to see Christ firsthand in the world around us. And for those who have listened very faithfully but have not had that experience, doubt is a very normal reaction. It's not a source of shame. It's a sign that your soul is craving something more and your faith is telling you, keep digging deeper, keep reaching farther, because what others have seen, you also long to see. And in this time of social distancing, we're all experiencing a little bit of FOMO. And like Thomas, we're wanting more. More activity, more normalcy, more fellowship, more comfort and peace and hope, more of life as we knew it. But there's kind of a catch with that. The disciples saw the risen Christ, and they were transformed by that experience. So, in fact, was Thomas when his turn came. This thing that we're craving, it's a door that opens and we walk through it. And we will be transformed by that journey by that step even, by the knowledge, by the experience. It might even be overwhelming to us. It might make us forget who we were before. It might also make us forget for a moment that everyone grieves change and does so differently, because everyone experiences that change in their own personal and unique way, and there is no one right way to experience change or to adapt to it or to move forward through it. There's only the way that we do it. Which brings us to that wonderful moment when Jesus came back to the house to see Thomas. Thomas, who could not bring himself to hear the truth and accept it secondhand. Thomas, who had a deep faith that cried out for that personalized experience of transformation. Thomas, whom we sometimes malign for his doubts. He asked more than the others had. He, he had a need to touch Jesus, not just see him. And he had to wait an extra week for that opportunity, but it came. Jesus came to the house again, and seeing Thomas, he instructed him to do exactly as he had said. Jesus knew exactly what Thomas needed in order to experience joy at the resurrection, and that is what he was given. God knows that Grace is not a one-size-fits-all gift. God has grace for everyone who asks, everyone who needs, and God knows that we won't all be ready for what we need at the same moment. Certainly not the same moment as someone who needs something different from us. Grace is fluid. It's given as needed, where needed, when needed, and it's given by God according to the wisdom of God. We don't make it happen. We can't always be there in somebody else's moments of joy, but that doesn't mean that we won't get to share in the joy with them. It just might take time. God's time. Maybe an extra week. Maybe seven. But however long it takes, we trust that God has something good for us. 
However long it takes us to feel safe leaving the house, however long it takes us to bring our whole self to the table, that's how long God gives us to join in. And however long it takes us to go from that moment to the point of having the courage and good sense to really know best how to venture out and share our good news, that is also how long God gives us to do so. And if, during that unknown span of time, we express our fear of missing out with some doubt, God won't hold that against us. God is not afraid of our doubt. God is not intimidated by our questions. God is not going to stop loving us when we resist. Not when it's out of fear. Not when it's because of doubts or logic that we don't understand. Not even when it's out of sheer stubbornness, like a toddler who just doesn't want to eat any more carrots. God still loves us. God is still faithful. And the same thing will hold true even if we ever fail to recognize someone else's fears because we're too busy being caught up in our own emotions. God won't hold that against us either. So Easter was last week. And yes, like the disciples, we are still at home. We are still trying to wrap our minds around everything that is happening. We are still worrying about things that are beyond our control. And we are still struggling to make sense of the joy and hope and fear and confusion and wonder that are running through our hearts. But like them, may we let ourselves really live in this moment, trusting God to give us clarity in God's Trusting Christ to be present with us, with us, each of us, as we need. And trusting that the grace we need is in fact coming our way, and that God is working within us to prepare us to receive it, and embrace it, and then share it. All in God's time. Amen. Would you sing with us one more time? Our closing hymn is Crown Him with Many Crowns. in these trying times may we remember that Christ will come and meet each of us where we are will bring grace to us 
exactly as we need. May we let go of our fear of missing out and trust that we are still in this and every moment and in these many places. We are beloved by God. We are safe in God's hands. May you go through the coming week with that knowledge in your heart. May God give you peace in the days ahead. Amen. Thank you.